so a very good morning to everyone uh, i dr poonam joshi welcome you all uh, to our uh, saturday actrac hadenic classes uh, today's speaker is dr ashavari patil madam uh, madam is professor in uh, department of pathology uh, tata memorial hospital mumbai madam will be speaking on uh, bethetsa grading and the molecular testing for thyroid carcinoma so we welcome you madam please go ahead with the presentation um good morning everyone uh, i thank dr poonam and her um, team for arranging this lecture for today uh, i'll just share my screen can you see my presentation dr poonam yes madam it is starting madam i can see the presentation great um just let me know if the slides are moving sure madam sure madam madam it is moving great so today's talk is on bethesda grading and molecular testing for thyroid cancer and the talk will be divided into two parts predominantly bethesda grading because unless you understand bethesda grading and the indications for molecular testing we cannot decide what type of molecular testing we can do so first of all let's talk about uh, thyroid fnac uh, quickly so what is the role of thyroid fnac in evaluation of any thyroid nodule it's a procedure of choice for evaluation when it is clinically indicated of course clinically means clinically and radiologically and this is one of the diagnostic modality which is still very important for uh, a workup of Uh, any cancer related to thyroid as against in other um, organ system where biopsy has replaced fnac in many of the organ systems it is rapid cost effective safe and reliable tool and it helps in first thing is diagnosis and di diagnosis of the thyroid nodule and approach or triaging the patients uh, for surgery when required and determining correct surgical procedure but when we have to remember that the accuracy depends both on the skills of the radiologist or surgeon or pathologist who is performing the fnac and also the experience and training of the pathologist who is going to interpreting the fnac smears so what are the challenges associated with thyroid fnac one is inadequate sample which is quite possible because many times the fnac is they result in hemorrhagic mass aspirate masking the cellular details again uh, one more problem with thyroid um, fnac is there are overlapping features in some of the benign and malignant tumors fnac you have to understand because it lacks the architecture it only uh, most of the time focuses on uh, the cellular morphology and for us as a pathologist to diagnose anything in addition to cellular morphology architecture is equally important which is many times lacking in the fnac so it has some limitations there there were confusing classification schemes earlier and that's why it was and interpreting the fnac and understanding the fnac results and how to triage the patient was kind of difficult earlier and nowadays when with ultrasound we are assessing smaller and smaller nodules there was a need to come up with a better uh, a classification system for uh, grading or interpretation of fnac earlier classification system you can see in here there was papanicolaou society cytopathology pathology task and then proposed by something proposed by ata or american thyroid association and so on but in 2007 finally final pathologist radiologist endocrinologist and the surgeons or the all the uh, all of them who are involved in managing any thyroid nodule they came together and uh, they devised a system or they established they uh, recommended they they provided guidelines how the thyroid fnac should be done what are the indications and how it can be interpreted and that was done in national cancer institute of Th Th for thyroid by fna state state of science conference which was held in bethesda maryland in 
and that's why it was called just called as Bethesda system. The full name is the Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytopathology or TBSRTC. Now, what is the use of or what, what, what are the important aspects of this system? First of all, it introduced a tired classification and calling us negative, positive, just uh, suspicious, etc. So there is a tired classification system. And not only that, this system is associated with risk of malignancy or malignancy risk. Uh, what is the potential risk of malignancy for each category, which is very important. It also comes up with uh, some guidelines for management. For a so if you see, this, uh, this is a summary of documents based on the literature review, and it in includes indication or pre-FNA requirements, training and credentialing of all the, um, uh, team, uh, all the team components which are involved. The technique of FNAC, terminologies and morphologic criteria, ancillary studies, if any required, and post and FNA options, which is very important because once you get the report of FNAC, what to do next? So this gives an option for further management if further tests are required and what else can be done. Now, remember, this is not a standard of practice. It is just recommendation, but it is very useful when it is followed in routine practice. So while we need to understand that evaluation of thyroid nodule, whenever it is detected on palpation, further evaluation is needed, especially when it is above one centimeter in size, and there are various tests required, clinical history, physical examination, and uh, serum or um, clinical pathology studies or biochemical studies. And when FNA, FNAC is to be done, there are certain indications. So FNAC is indicated in any nodule which is clinically suspicious of malignancy, or if there is any significant family history, or any radiological suspicion when it is required to further evaluate the nodule. Now, functioning thyroid nodules in absence of clinical ultrasound findings usually do not require FNA as the risk of malignancy is low. Again, ISO or hypofunctioning nodule on radionuclear scan should be considered for FNA if the ultrasound findings are indicated or indicative of uh, doing FNA. So, as you, as you understand, here there are multiple um, uh, team members inv involved in this. First of all, the surgeon or clinician whosoever is, who is examining the FNSC, uh, sorry, whosoever is examining the thyroid nodule, their index of suspicion if they think it is uh, FNSC is required for further, uh, further, um, uh, further information on that nodule. Second important co team component is radiologist who is going to perform the FNSC uh, and who most of the times and who is going to first do ultrasound and decide whether this needs further FNA or it can be followed without doing any FNSC. And third important component is pathologist who may be involved in FNSC, especially sometimes pathologists can themselves do the FNSC or if it is radiologically or image guided FNSC, pathologist or cytotechnologist as in our institute, they are present at the site of FNAC or in the uh, at the time of FNAC for on-site adequacy evaluation. Now, any clinically significant nodule should undergo FNA that is more than one centimeter di diameter, primarily solid, any nodule that is sonographically suspicious, all incidental lomas, all focal FTG avid lesions, any hot nodules and system AV scan. So all of these are indication for performing FNA. As you send the FNAC request, what are the things that are required and what are the what is the information that a pathologist ex expects from you is uh, all the demographic uh, information about the patient, clinical histology, including uh, clinical histories, including size, location, and duration of the nodule, ultrasound findings, lab tests, any other important history associated with it, like uh, Graves' disease, hypothyroidism, any history of prior therapy, any history of fam, 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 any family history of cancer. So all this um, information is required, especially when we are reporting FNAC 
we always look at this because we have this electronic medical record we can always look at this but when anybody from outside um, tmh or tmc said, to understand that anybody from outside the um, tmh or actrec they are sending any fnsa request that time we require all these details just for that they are, they are helpful in interpreting the fnsa so let's understand the Bethes dot terminology. There are six categories. Number one is non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory. Number two is benign. Number three is ATP of undetermined significance called as AUS or other name is follicular lesion or in a follicular lesion of undetermined significance that is FLUS. The fourth category is follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm also called as FN or SFN. Then fifth category is suspicious of malignancy, it is SO, SOM. And sixth category is frank malignant. Now, what is the morphology? We'll go to it in detail, but as you see here, usually when it is a cystic nodule or cyst fluid only, we call it as non-diagnostic. One thing you have to remember, whenever we call anything as a diagnostic FNAC, we need to see some minimum number of spin thyroid follicular cells or if not thyroid follicular cells, at least malignant cells. So if there are no malignant cells, we require certain number of thyroid follicular cells in, in clusters. And um, that is required unless and until that is present, we, we will call it as non-diagnostic. Then the other category is when there is some cytological ATP which is not diagnostic of any malignancy, we'll call it as ATP of undetermined significance or significance or category three. Follicular neoplasm is particular uh, is a one specific diagnosis which can be follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm when there are follicular cells. Uh, in uh, abundant uh, abundant number of follicular cells and we don't see any definite criteria for papillary thyroid carcinoma or for any other malignancy. Suspicious of malignancy is something that we suspect malignancy, but the features are just not enough to label it as malignant. And the last category is malignancy. Let's look at this category, each, each of these categories one by one, but what is the significance of this category? This table indicates it is from uh, recent publication in 2008 from SIBAS that there is a risk of malignancy attached to each category and there is this usual management which is required. So if you see when it is non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory, as compared to benign, the risk of malignancy is high because we do not have diagnostic um, material in the FNSS smears. After benign category, the category three, four, and five, and six, the risk of malignancy gradually increases from 10 to 30% in AUS, 25 to 40% in follicular neoplasm, 50 to 75% or more in suspicious mal for malignancy, while malignancy, when, when we, when, whenever we call anything malignant, the risk of malignancy is always 97 to 99%. The column on the right-hand side gives you indicate what, what is the usual management, but we are going to see it in detail later on. There is another caveat to this uh, reporting of Bethesda system or with reporting of thyroid FNA and risk of malignancy because initially when it was introduced in 2007, afterwards, Nikki Foro and his team, they introduced this term called as NIFP or non-invasive follicular tumor with a papillary-like nuclear features. Now, this is something which has papillary-like nuclear features which can be diagnosed on FNAC, but the problem here is diagnosis of NIFT P depends on invasion, capsular vascular invasion. There are other criteria which are something we can group it under architectural criteria. Now, these architectural criteria, capsular invasion, vascular invasion, we cannot identify in FNAC. So obviously, any nodule that qualifies for NIFT P, if you Aspirate that nodule, it's going to show something, features something like either follicular neoplasm or AUS or something probably suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. So with this, 
they now they have defined two different categories. If NIFP is not considered as carcinoma, then as you see in the second column of this table, the risk of malignancy is slightly lower. But if the NIFP is considered equal to carcinoma, the risk of malignancy is slightly higher, which is which was described earlier. Now, can we diagnose NIFP on FNAC? We cannot. We'll just give you something between Bethesda 3 to Bethesda 5, rarely Bethesda 6. Usually it is up to Bethesda 3 to Bethesda 5. So coming to category one, this is usually cyst fluid only. It may be a cellular specimen, or sometimes there are other obscuring factors such as blood clots in which all the cells get enmeshed and we cannot see the morphology. And in that case, we cannot give you any diagnosis. It constitutes usually two to 16% of all FNAs. And out of this, usually seven to 26%, they are eventually resected uh, this case is uh, the thyroid lobectomy or total thyroidectomy is performed. But you remember this is done only after repeat evaluation when a definitive category is assigned to these cases. Now, predicted risk of malignancy, we already said, we have seen that 5 to 10 percent. How they should be managed? A repeat FNA, especially with ultrasound guidance, and if possible, on site adequacy evaluation is required. <coughs> to make sure that we are getting a definitive FNA in, uh, in these cases. So usually these cases, as you see here in this uh, photograph, there is some blood and macrophages. Here you see only blood. So this is something what we see without any follicular cells. In that case, we'll call it as um, Bethesda category one. Now there is one important thing is that if this is Ultrasound um, uh, examination suggests this is a purely cystic nodule and it is not suspicious for malignancy. Then we can, with our report as Bethesda category one, we can also say that it is showing predominantly cyst fluid and possibility of benign cystic lesion is uh, considered. So in those cases, depending on clinical and radiologic finding, the clinicians may or may not go for repeat FNA. Coming to the second category, which includes something like benign diseases, nodular goiter, colloid nodule, lymphocytic thyroiditis, granulomatous inflammation, and so on, the risk of malignancy when we give it as a category two is very low, zero to three percent. And as you see in this uh, picture, you have a lot of colloid mixed blood with some benign thyroid follicular cells, which is seen in higher magnification, benign thyroid follicular cells. So how we should manage them? The recommended management for these cases is clinical and sonographic follow-up. So in these cases, when we call category two, initial sonography findings are very important. If there is high suspicion on USG, you can you repeat the uh, FNAC under USG guided uh, within 12 months, whenever you think, uh, whenever the clinician thinks that it is essential to repeat it, something is not matching with the USG pattern, the Bethesda report category is not matching with USG pattern. But if the USG suspicion is low to intermediate, then the USG can be repeated after 12 months and FNAC can be done only if it is indicated. If the USG pattern is very low, showing very low suspicion for malignancy, then utility of ultrasound is surveillance is limited. It is entirely depending on the clinical history and clinical examination, may be repeated after 24 months. Now, if we repeat USG guided FNAC and second time again you are getting benign thyroid benign cytology or category two, usually USG surveillance is no longer indicated. Coming to category three, it includes morphological features such as cytologic atypia, now architectural atypia has limited uh, significance, but we do get sometimes architectural atypia. Further presence of further cells and atypia not otherwise specified. Now, one thing you have to remember, especially pathologists, they have to remember that anything which is not fitting in category two or category four, five, six, we tend to put that in category three. But this is not a waste basket category. 
So category three should not constitute more than 10% of total thyroid FNS in any institute. And we have to aim for uh, category three up to 7% only. So this is something category three when we have a lot of cells with oncocytic features. This is higher magnification with some nucleomegaly. And in that cases, we, we tend to call tend to call category three. Sometimes the nucleo, there is a there's possicellular smear with one or two cells showing some papillary-like nuclear feature. We are not sure. In that case, also we may call it as category three. Now, what is the recommended management? Now, this is a category which needs to be evaluated further. Usually, the, the, the first step in evaluation is repetitive FNA. Repeat FNA usually results in most more definitive results, but still 10 to 30% cases may get a second time AUS diagnosis. Now, these are the tests where the molecular testing can be useful. We are going to discuss molecular testing later on in detail, but uh, we have to understand here, we don't know exactly uh, how many cases will turn out uh, malignant or how many cases will need surgical intervention. So we have to go for further testing if available. And these tests, there are certain tests called as ruling tests, certain tests called as rule out tests. Ruling tests basically are for ruling in for surgery. So ruling tests when they are positive surgery is indicated. Ruling rule out test is for surgery to be ruled out, and they are if they are positive, the surgery possibility of surgical intervention can be ruled out. Now here in FIN category three, ruling test these are something like BRAF V600 600 E mutations. They have very low sensitivity, so we may or may not be able to depend on that. But there are other rule out tests such as Afferma gene expression classifier, or there are. Uh, thyrosic, uh, there are different versions of thyrosic. Now, these tests, approximately 50% of AUS can turn out G with this test negative. Now, when these uh, tests are negative, the rule of tests are negative, that reduces risk of malignancy and that patient may not need any further surgical intervention. Now, when these tests are not available, what should one do? And this is possible in most of the part in our country. So lobectomy, it may be considered, which is a decision based on uh, clean, your, your clinical uh, in, uh, clinical uh, findings, as well as radiology findings. Together, everything has to put together with uh, Bethesda category and risk of malignancy should be uh, calculated and that can be, uh, the decision for lobectomy can be taken. Now, in this kind of selected surgical, surgical treated cases, the risk of malignancy, average risk of malignancy is around 47%. That's the mean, although various studies uh, show a wide range of risk of malignancy in these cases. So basically, for uh, TBSR, uh, TBSRTC category three, first is repeat, repeat FNA, second time AOS diagnosis, if possible, get molecular tests done. If not possible, put all the clinical findings and radiological findings together and selected cases, lobectomy can be done. Coming to Bethesda category four. Now this category is called as follicular neoplasm or FN or suspicious for follicular neoplasm, SFN or hurdle cell neoplasm, that is HCN. Here the risk of malignancy can be 10 to 40% and management recommended is lobectomy is the standard of care as per ATA guidelines. But clinical and sonographic findings along with malignant molecular testing may be used to supplement the decision for lobectomy to assess the risk of malignancy. So all other tests, including molecular tests, these are supplementary here. So these are some of our examples of cases showing follicular neoplasm with a lot of cellularity, microfollicular pattern, but there are no features of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Here for surgery residents, I want to um, emphasize on this fact that whenever we see adequate cellularity and some ATPI in the cells, we look for either papillary nuclear features or any other indication for malignancy. Papillary nuclear features are specific like nuclear enlargement, crowding, chromatin clearing, and grooves and pseudo-inclusions. 
if these are present, we it helps us to call it as papillary thyroid carcinoma. There are other malignancies where we can get some specific features such as it could be medullary thyroid carcinoma where the features can be specific. Anaplastic thyroid carcinoma has specific features. And if none of these are present, but we see this cellular smears like what you have seen on the screen right now, we think we know that there's something wrong, but we can't say whether it is malignant or not. Why we call it as follicular neoplasm? Because follicular neoplasm includes either follicular adenoma versus car follicular carcinoma. And the diagnosis depends on architecture or uh, precisely if it's the capsular or vascular invasion. Now, capsular or vascular invasion, we cannot identify on FNAC. That's the reason we tend, out, tend to call this as follicular neoplasm. We cannot differentiate follicular adenoma from follicular carcinoma in these smears alone. So this is one limitation of FNAC in thyroid when we cannot differentiate between follicular uh, malignant versus uh, benign follicular tumors. Coming to category 5, now this could be suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Usually, follicular variant of papillary carcinoma can give rise to such problems because the features may be just borderline. Again, suspicious for medullary carcinoma, suspicious for other malignancies. You have to remember uh, there, there are some malignancies in thyroid which are not thyroid follicular or uh, C cell origin. Or that means they are not thyroid follicular cell derived tumors or medullary carcinoma. They can be lymphoma, they can be sarcoma, they can be metastasis from other sites. So in these cases, we will say it is, it is suspicious or it is uh, malignancy is present, but we may or may not be able to categorize it further and we may ask for a biopsy. So suspicions for, for neoplasm, sometimes there can be extensive necrosis. Now, anaplastic carcinoma can show or even poorly differentiated carcinoma can show necrosis. If we see a lot of necrotic material in the FNAC, but we don't see enough cellular component to call it as malignant, we may call it as suspicious for neoplasm or suspicious for malignancy. But there are various uh, categories when we say suspicious for malignancy. And um, further, uh, what how this uh, these cases should be managed? Uh, there are particular um, uh, there there are specific management uh, requirements. Or so there are cases like this where we think it could be papillary, papillary thyroid carcinoma, but the features are not definite for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Sometimes we see some papillary structures, but the nuclear features are not really that good. So in these cases, we may or may not call it as directly papillary thyroid carcinoma. A little bit better um, smear may we may end up calling it as category six papillary thyroid carcinoma, or we may call it if they are falling short. Uh, we may call it as suspicious, uh, suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now, in these cases, the risk of malignancy is high, 45 to 60 percent. Now, what is the management? Again, these are the cases where surgery, whatever surgery is intended for malignancy, is required. What I mean by intended for malignancy means you have to look at what is our diagnosis. Are we calling that as suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma, are we calling it as suspicious for medullary thyroid carcinoma? That is very important. Sometimes we may say that it's suspicious for malignancy, cannot categorize further, we need more material. So in that case, maybe repeat FNA or biopsy may be required. This may be required, especially when um, we need some kind of F, uh, immunohistochemistry studies. Like we can see some features suspicious for malignancy, especially it is lymphoma or suspected metastasis from other side. And there we need to know what type of malignancy it is. As you know, lymphoma does not need surgery. And lymphoma and other round cell tumors is one category where the biopsy is required to avoid the surgery and to give, uh, to give optimum treatment for the patient, usually which is, this is chemotherapy. So, Management, although it is usually it is surgery, most of the times it can be total thyroidectomy, but we have to take into account the clinical and radiologic data, risk stratification, molecular studies. But molecular studies here of, are of limited use. Most of the times, category five, very rarely you need to go for molecular studies. It is done only when 
molecular studies are expected to alter expected to alter the surgical decision what do the ata guidelines say molecular studies are not reflexively performed or routinely recommended but may be requested if clinically indicated so it entirely depends on whatever what is the clinical diagnosis in this case or clinical uh, suspicion in this case the last category is category 6 malignancy and we try to specify this we call it as uh, mali mali was uh, positive for malignancy and it shows papillary thyroid carcinoma if we can say poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma or sometimes may say differentials considered are poorly differentiated versus medullary thyroid carcinoma in that case serum calcitonin you know, we will request that uh, uh, work up for uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma is necessary anaplastic features when they are present we will say that anaplastic carcinoma rarely there are other malignancies i said earlier it can be squamous cell carcinoma which is very rare but from adjacent organs you can see it you can see metastasis from other sides and rarely it could be lymphoma or other sarcomas so in that case depending upon the type of malignancy we have to decide what would be the next step of next step in management here we have some cases where i'm showing you i know it is Uh, it's primarily for surgery resident but a path as being a pathologist i cannot avoid showing some pathology pictures so this is a papillary thyroid carcinoma with some pseudo inclusions in the nuclei another uh, uh, picture showing uh, suggestive of papillary thyroid carcinoma although it is not the best picture i would say then these are the cases where this is a medullary thyroid carcinoma suspected uh, we do see some areas showing uh, amyloid like material which is a blob in the middle this is another suspected medullary thyroid carcinoma with amyloid like material and this is a frank case of anaplastic carcinoma especially when we see such big cells uh, we know that we are dealing with this is anaplastic carcinoma and we make this diagnosis especially when the epicenter of the tumor is thyroid if the tumor is originating outside thyroid we will not call it as anaplastic carcinoma in that case and these are the cases where we require the clinical and radiological findings what is the management it is the risk of malignancy as i said very high so management is surgery and other treatment modalities depending upon the type of malignancy now i will not go into the details of management because you know better than me now coming to some ancillary studies can we do some ancillary studies on thyroid fnac yes definitely we can do that now ancillary studies usually are required based on the morphologic characteristics and um, better uh, ancillary studies can be immunocytochemistry and second is molecular te techniques now here i want to say something about immunocytochemistry it is very difficult to standardize immunocytochemistry not a very good option although sometimes especially for medullary thyroid carcinoma calcitonin can be useful molecular test, test techniques yes definitely they are useful and we'll discuss this in later part of this talk so what are the isc's that we can do in um, thyroid fna isc is mostly useful for medullary thyroid carcinoma which is calcitonin or cea or chromogranin or it can be usually for metastatic carcinoma because they will be ttf1 negative with ttf1 is a marker for thyroid thyroid follicular origin tumors or benign thyroid as well isc can be useful for lymphoma but lymph for lymphoma best option would be either tissue diagnosis or flow cytometry anaplastic carcinoma yes we can try for isc but usually they are negative but that's why we usually don't ask for isc and any metastatic thyroid carcinoma at other site can be diagnosed with isc again parathyroid tissue or parathyroid tumor there are isc available see parathyroid tumors or tissue will be negative for ttf1 and positive for chromogranin pth we don't have it with us so in that case it would be helpful uh, to guide us what it could be now the second part of this talk is molecular testing for thyroid cancer we once you have understood the bethesda categories and exact the uh, possibilities how to manage the patient we now we know that the problematic categories are mainly category 3 and 4 five sometimes there are clear cut guidelines for 
uh, category one and two, clear cut guidelines for category six because we have already called it malignancy. malignancy. Category three and four, these are the uh, uh, groups where we need to see, uh, we may need to do further testing to see if that helps us to triage the patient. Now, before we understand the molecular test in thyroid cancer, we need to know what briefly we need to know what are the mole what is the molecular pathology. Now you need to 90% thyroid specific molecules. This is a multi-step process. So we will have some mutations in a differentiated cancers that are specific. But as the grade goes up or more and more aggressive tumor you see, there is the, the additional molecular alterations, they happen and there's accumulation of these molecular alterations in the higher grade tumors or aggressive tumors. The types of molecular alterations, usually they are driver mutations and gene fusions. And majority of the driver mutations which are identified in well-differentiated thyroid cancers, they are mutually exclusive. So they can be indicative of a type of thyroid tumor in differentiated thyroid cancer. There is another area we need to understand <coughs> is there are two important signaling pathways. And one is my MAPK pathway. It is activated through point mutation for BRA, RAS genes, red PTC rearrangement, et cetera. And there is another PI3K AKT pathway which is activated through point mutations of RAS, PI3K, CA, AKT1, PT1, PT1. So if you look at the well-differentiated tumors or differentiated thyroid follicular tumors, the activation of these two pathways is usually mutually exclusive. However, if we look at the higher grade or de-differentiated tumor, you may see sometimes simultaneous activation and usually there are additional molecular alterations. So coming to major driver mutations in thyroid cancer, there's BRAF mutations and RAS mutations. Amongst the BRAF, BRAF V600E is the most common genetic alteration in papillary thyroid carcinoma, which can be diagnosed with PCR, which can be diagnosed with IC also. And it is associated with aggressive behavior of PTC, which is, and it is a highly sensitive marker for preoperative evaluation, especially when we are calling it Bethesda category three to five. Now, second mutation is RAS mutation, which includes KRAS, NRAS, and HRAS, which is more prevalent in follicular carcinoma and even certain types of follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. You have to remember that follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, now there are two groups. So one is invasive follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, which behaves and shows genetic alteration more like a differentiated papillary thyroid carcinoma. But all those encapsulated, minimally invasive follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, they behave closely to follicular carcinomas and like minimally invasive follicular carcinoma. And even the molecular alterations will be uh, similar to follicular carcinomas. But the caveat here is, these alterations can be found sometimes in benign neoplasm so RAS mutation finding is of less diagnostic utility for preoperative pre evaluation. Coming to red PTC rearrangement, there are others, other alterations in thyroid cancer. This is the enumerated red PTC rearrangement uh, is seen in 20 to 20% of sporadic adult papillary thyroid carcinoma. But important thing is that risk of malignancy is very high. So presence of red PTC rearrangement uh, definitely uh, uh, labels the case as malignancy. Then there are Paxet PPKR uh, rearrangement this, that can be seen in 30 to 40 per percent of follicular carcinomas, but diagnostic utility again as a sole marker is insufficient. But there are these all alterations again, AKT mutations, stroke promoter mutations, and rest of them. All of these, when put together in a gene panel, they can give us a risk stratification for. <clears throat> A particular thyroid nodule and as you see in this <coughs> excuse me is in these nodules in, in this figure uh, given by ata guidelines in 2015 you can see that the low risk tumors they are different uh, as you see but then higher risk tumors these are the one 
which are extensive vascular and all these tumors and they will these are higher risk tumors may show tert mutation in addition to braf mutation but the lower risk may be just braf mutated so this is a table that shows uh, uh, average prevalence of mutations in poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma as well as in other carcinomas as you see here braf is the most common in papillary carcinoma and followed by red ptc and some ras but for follicular carcinoma it is uh, uh, mainly ras pdtc or pure poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma again there are multiple mutations including ras braf and tp53 anaplastic carcinoma there are again multiple mutations starting from ras braf but additional mutations like tp53 and beta catenin and this is the recent uh, nikiforov um, uh, recent picture give, given by nikiforov and his group about the frequency of different mutations and genetic alterations in different thyroid tumors so now coming to the molecular test for diagnosis of thyroid cancer now we need to understand what are the techniques for molecular test uh, that can be used first of all it can be rt pcr or dna sequencing which is mainly for mutation point mutation detection so point mutation detection can be detected with any of these but the chromosomal rearrangement that can be detected either by rt pcr or pif now there are certain mutations like braf b6 and 600e can be diagnosed with immunohistochemistry as well and we do have that immunohistochemistry available with us we need to understand what is the indication for molecular test because molecular test as ata has guidelines has have explained that they will be useful only in certain set of uh, subset subset of uh, patients uh, especially when pre operative diagnosis of thyroid follicles thyroid nodules is indeterminate with fna is indeterminate and as we discussed earlier it is the bethesda category 3 which is the most important which can uh, be subjected to <coughs> molecular further molecular test bethesda 4 and 5 depending on the clinical and sonographic uh, or uh, radiology findings we can decide whether uh, molecular tests are required or not now can we do molecular test on this fnc whatever available or we need to do extra fnc most of the times if we have enough material on the fnc smear enough cells on the fnc smear the same smears we can use them for molecular testing we just scrape those cells and they can be further put for molecular testing so the adequate material if we have adequate material adequate yield of tissue in the fnc we don't have to go for a repeat fna now if the fnc is showing only few cells a repeat fna may be required in any case for bethesda 3 you are going to go for repeat fnc all that we need is adequate tissue on the fnc which can be further uh, utilized for molecular testing sometimes these molecular tests can be of prognostic utility for aggressive disease and now for therapy now here we need to understand the categories of molecular test one is rulin test and other is rule out test as i said this is in context with the surgery rulin rulin test indicate that surgery is indicated or surgery is required rule out test have uh, they rule out the surgery so mutational and gene rearrangement arrangement test they have high specificity and pp high predictive positive predictive value and they identify a subset of patient who can be benefited from upfront lobectomy or total thyroid thyroidectomy especially total thyroidectomy that but thereby reducing a need for two stage procedure now where it can be used especially when you are suspecting papillary thyroid carcinoma or uh, and which test we can use it is the braf test and Uh, red ptc rearrangement this will be more important for uh, more important when can that can be used for rule in test coming to rule out test this is a these are usually a big panels and they are based on the gene expression profiles they have high negative predictive value low positive predictive value and uh, this is especially useful like if any particular case we are calling it as bethesda category 3 or maybe four and it has high negative predictive value 
then the surgery can be ruled out or can be deferred till further follow up so in such in in these cases like it obvious the risk of surgical excision in almost 50% of cases so once we understand what type of test is required we can use those particular test now ex exact what are the categories of the test the rule in tests are mutations as i said which is braf and ras and then gene rearrangement like red ptc then there are few small multigen panels we do have small multigen panels but the rule out test which you probably you have heard of them there are uh, some uh, well established tests such as afirma gene expression classifier which is an rna based test then therosec nowadays it's a version 3 dna rna based test and then thigen next thyroimir which is another test i'm not going to go into the details of these test again medullary thyroid carcinoma is altogether a different topic which should be discussed so red mutations and all risk need to be discussed especially for suspected uh, familial uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma which i have not included in today's talk this is just to show how rule out and rule in test can be helpful so we do an fna which is an indeterminate and we have to decide whether lobectomy is for total thyroid required or not if we do a rule out test and it has it is positive the patient can be triaged for clinical follow up but if it is negative and other tests are indicative of total thyroidectomy then it can be sent for total thyroidectomy but basically this is most useful to obviate the risk the need of surgery rather than to decide whether surgery to be done or, done or not so rule out test positive rule out test in indeterminate fna is helpful to rule out possibility of uh, or uh, rule out the need for surgery on the other hand rule in test in indeterminate uh, category of fnc it it has high pred positive predictive value and if it is positive it definitely indicates either a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy depending on uh, clinical and radiological findings so i hope this um, basics of molecular test is clear to all of you uh, the take home message in today's uh, um, discussion is fnc diagnosis for thyroid cancer can be usually done on pap and gym sustain smear with adequate cellularity and uh, preserved or good morphological features but correlation with clinical and ultrasound findings is very essential ancillary studies may be required in some cases including uh, in immunocytochemistry and molecular techniques i am i the last um, last um, line molecular techniques are promising but of limited value uh, we have to take it into context of what kind of type of category or what category of fnc we are dealing with but bethesda category 3 definitely has a value category 4 and 5 has some value but it in addition to clinical and sonology sonographic findings definitely usually not needed right now for majority of the benign categories or uh, even for malignant categories depending on the type of malignancy molecular techniques may be required especially when we are calling something as uh, lymphoma molecular test with other tests for lymphoma are required when we are we are on a diagnosis something as a diagnosing something as a thyroid car follicular origin carcinoma or poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma may be required although they are not definitely necessary so with this i conclude my talk and uh, um, it's now open for discussion if you have any questions i thank you all and jai hind uh, thank you so much madam wonderful lecture uh ma'am uh, i think uh, if somebody posed the question i just had one question like uh, we like uh, you said yeah, for uh, that it's a grade 3 and grade 4 uh, are the yeah. places where we need a repeat we need sometimes a molecular test to uh, decide for <laughs> surgical intervention so ma'am yeah. uh, how common it it is in your practice? is that uh, if we do a repeat fna in how many cases uh, like uh, our definitive diagnosis can be made mainly for bethesda 3 and 4 honestly punam i don't have answer for this because still we are not getting that many requisition for um all these studies 
recently they are uh, we are getting little more requisition but uh, there are very few so we do not i will not be able to say anything about our data or our practice definitely right. those um, institutes where it is done commonly they have more promising results especially for bethesda 3 so it depends on the institute where it is practiced more commonly the more commonly we use it we can have our own algorithm based on our studies uh, our findings in fnsc and further molecular studies so we need more requisition for molecular studies we do have all the test available here i want to say that all the test available means there are point filtration test basically and there is a thyroid small panel for which includes bira ras mutations and tor promoter mutations uh, if you anybody needs all those other thyrosec or aparma that's not something which is an institution based study this the best uh, test these are uh, private uh, private uh, i mean these are the tests that are developed in private labs so uh, that has to be given it to them they are not available in a, any of this available cannot be available in our institute but of course there will be some uh, some more information how we can send material to those labs or the, those uh, studies thank you madam madam i think there is one question uh, by yeah. one of the student pathetsa versus pathetsa 6 malignant but treatment plan is near total thyroidectomy near total thyroidectomy is not nowadays so uh, uh, that that actually i would say it's your call punam yes i right yes, person to answer that so i would say uh, that uh, we never do a near total thyroidectomy i think that was a old concept when we used to be behind some of the thyroid issue in, into the to group and uh, that was we used to call one term as a sub total thyroidectomy another was near total thyroidectomy so that we used to say around uh, like 1 gram or sometimes we used to say size of the uh, small uh, thumb so that we used to leave around uh, but now there is no concept like uh, to near total thyroidectomy when it is a malignant we have to take decisions based upon the clinical factors like the madam uh, has shown us the bethesda grading and the molecular test so according to that we have to take decision either it is going to be a hemi thyroidectomy or a total thyroidectomy so even a malignant uh, bethesda 6 grading we can do hemi thyroidectomy depending upon so many other factors which is actually a different uh, discussion altogether i hope that answers at the same for the same reason i did not include a discussion for medullary thyroid carcinoma because it is entirely a separate topic and um, yes bethesda we do discuss medullary thyroid carcinoma but i think genetic alteration and all the approach and molecular test everything has to be discussed separately for medullary thyroid carcinoma right ma'am that is entirely different so i think uh, if there are any other questions uh, we would take them yes sure i mean if there are any ma'am what is the role of this usg guided uh, we say tg values so whenever we read na uh, t, uh, uh, ata guidelines we hmm. say sometimes when the diagnosis is not clear uh, we can do usg guided uh, tg levels so uh, like or i am not able to put it properly but i think that is one point we do sometimes they say to do it from the nodes also in the neck so suppose we don't have a definitive diagnosis of the thyroid and there is a node which is not very suspicious on sonography but there is a yeah tg was wash out correct so what is the role of tg wash out ma'am uh, honestly um i really won't be able to comment on that because we had never never do that, never do that. yes no, no, no. you're right that's why because ata guidelines everywhere they have written it but in routine practice at least at tmh we don't follow that we have never never followed it yes ma'am so i think our clinical decision is based our decisions uh, are based on clinical assessment radiological like you said our fnac findings but that's a and then whenever it is needed the molecular test so based right. on that we can almost always take a decision for uh, the surgical intervention so uh, with this uh, ma'am i thank you once again it was an excellent lecture uh, one of the i think student has had very in depth lecture exactly uh, and we are really thankful to you thank you very much ponam and um, i thank all of you who attended this lecture
So should we conclude now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you all.